Well, to start with, I've got a theory, and my theory is that those that are interested in teaching and learning are more observant than the general population. Now, is it okay if I test that theory out with you? Okay. Here's a quick quiz. I'm going to play a very short video of one of the lecturers at UWS. And I'm going to ask you one question about that video, and we'll see if you're more observant than the general population. The last lecture, I think, finished off with problem solving, and I left you a couple of problems to have a go at. The Nine Dots Award, or problem, I think you've probably all been able to do, so anybody couldn't do it. Good, so I can call anybody down here to do it on the board for me, can I? So anybody couldn't do it? Okay. I'm going to give you one question. Don't yell the answer out if you know it straight away. Um, we'll, we'll get a, a show of hands. But the question is, what's the name of the lecturer? Uh. <laughs> Hand up if you know. Okay, I'll give you a clue. You all know his name. No? Okay. That happens to be me. Um, <laughs> once upon a time, I was like Patrick Swayze. Uh, now I'm a bit more like Gary Sweet. So that's the way it goes. All right, I do this, I start off my presentation to illustrate four things. First thing is I used to look pretty good when I was younger. The next one is I've been involved with technology and teaching for a long time. The next one is that some things have changed, obviously with me, but some things haven't. If we uh, look at a thing called the horseless carriage syndrome, does anybody know what that is or can say what that is? Yep. I guess when I first started building cars, I felt in my carriages because they were an uh, evolution that mode of exactly. The first cars were horseless carriages and they had buggy whip holders for three or four years even though they didn't need buggy whips anymore. And how that translates is when we take a new technology we tend to use it the same way we always have. For example, the first films were stage plays set with a fixed position camera. We've got a fixed position camera at the moment and they were stage plays shot like that. That was how I was doing multi-campus lectures in 1991. Has it improved? Well, let's have a look at MIT, Open Courseware, uh, some of the best teaching in the world. First time of, I don't know how many times I'm going to say that this year, everything we know about chemistry was learned in a laboratory. So we insist that you go into... So uh, I'd like to thank the organisers of Moodle Posium because what you're doing is helping to avoid the horseless carriage syndrome. Now, there's nothing wrong with recording lectures. That's good for... for uh, people who want to look at them later on or if you've got a guest speaker in and so on. But if that's all we're doing with technology, if we're just doing echo and that's it, we're not using the technology to the best of its ability. So my background, I started off actually as a school teacher, a biology teacher, and then I bought my first computer in 1980. It was a Dick Smith System 80 with 4K of memory. Now I've got credit cards in my pocket that have um, more than uh, 4K. I can see a nod with System 80. Who else remembers System 80? Yep, few, yep, showing your age now. Uh, I've got various postgraduate qualifications, all in adult education, online learning. I did a Doctor of Teaching degree where I looked at how to use online training for um, professional development. Uh, I ended up becoming the Director of Postgraduate ICT at uh, UWS. But in the meantime, part-time, I was developing apps, e-books, iBooks, membership sites, I was consulting to business and consulting uh, to schools and to universities. And about two years ago, they were offering voluntary redundancies at UWS. The enrolments had dropped, so I put my hand up for one. They didn't want to give it to me, but I talked them into it. So I became an adjunct fellow, which meant that I could have an office, I could use the library, but they wouldn't pay me any money. So what I did was move full-time um, to develop my own business. But I'm someone who knows about online training, and so full-time now for me is one hour a week. Okay? I put everything online, and for my small business people that I mentor, I have one hour a week where I say, you can come on and ask me any questions you want. That's all it takes me. Just after I took the redundancy, uh, UWS decided they were going to get into blended learning and online learning in a big way. They bought iPads for all the first-year students. And so I thought I'd really like to pay it forward, and so I applied and now I'm also on contract, short-term contract, as a blended learning advisor for them to help them with that, that rollout. 
some of the projects I've been working on, uh, the large ones, student feedback on teaching at UWS, which was also implemented at Curtin and Avondale College, and Platform Web was an LMS. It was about the time of WebCT, it was, we were using it, one of the network members, but politics got in the way and, and, uh, and we got kicked out. But there's still some sections of it which are in use today. Also, the student pre-registration system uh, I helped develop. We used to do, do it on paper and it was messy and people would scratch people's names out and put their own name on. And so we put into a, a fully online one. And it was interesting, years later, they decided, oh, we need to upgrade it a little bit. We'll get a commercial outfit to come in. And we were academics who just did this as a part-time project. The cost of the university to rewrite it, $400,000 know, for what we did just as a, uh, a part-time thing. Uh, with industry, Apple sent me over to San Francisco with the Apple University Consortium in 2009 to learn more about um, development and I was lucky enough to be sent again in 2011. Last year, uh, because I've been working with businesses as well, uh, I won a Mobile and Digital Marketing Leadership Award over in Mumbai. So I have a rather unique combination of skills. I've got the education background, I've been teaching for years and years and years, I've got postgraduate qualifications in it, technology, I taught myself computing and went through there, and through circumstances I've ended up learning a lot about marketing, and I'll, I'll tell you about that in a moment. So just looking at those skills, do they make a difference? So what I'm going to do is show you a case study. Now this will be a commercial case study, but it's important to realise that education, even if you're a government institution, you are in the marketplace. You are going to be competing against other people, so marketing will become important for you. But this is a commercial one, non-accredited course. It's a case study of my fa most favourite client. She's my most attractive client. I can say that because that's my wife. Uh, her name's Tony, and she trades as the veggie lady. Her business started when the kids were young, and she just had to get out of the house. She needed a break. She enjoyed gardening, so she studied horticulture at... Pat Stowe TAFE. She started teaching at community college classes, which was all well and good. The big problem was they were in charge of the marketing. So often she'd have no one turn up, you know, two or three people at the classes. So at the time I was, you know, head of IT at UWS, so we said, let's get together. I'll put my IT skills uh, with your uh, background and see what we can do. So let's see what's happened since then. Yeah, we joined forces. About three years ago, I said to her, you should write a blog. And her uh, response was, what's a blog? She had no idea what a blog was. So that was her technical uh, level. Showed her how to do a blog, and we've got Facebook and all the rest. And since then, we had ABC ring up and say, we need a regular presenter for organic gardening with Andrew Datto. MasterChef invited us to do the, their expo. She writes for magazines all around the world. She writes for blogs all around the world. And uh, it was really interesting. We did the organic expo, and she was off teaching. I was at the stand, and this very attractive middle-aged lady came up, and she said, look, we've seen your website, seen your Facebook, love what you do. Um, my daughter would like to, to work with you. You may have heard of her. Her name's Miranda Kerr. Yeah. And so Tony was one of the guest bloggers for Miranda Kerr's organic range, which included people like Wayne Dwyer and Deepak Chopper and you know, sort of international names. On top of that, uh, we had... Sydney weekend to come and do an episode from our backyard. Now remember, this is education. She teaches people. And she was having three people in the class and getting paid $30 an hour. So marketing really and technology helped. So it's pretty good for someone who does um, backyard workshops from uh, a suburb. Now what I want to do today, I'm assuming that you've got the educational knowledge. We'll touch on some things there. But what I want to do is cover some topics you may not be aware of in the technology and the marketing side of things. So this first part, we'll focus on the technology. As you're aware, change is happening. Now, I remember, all the people with the Dick Smith System 80 will remember all of these things. How many people can remember these things? Oh, we've got an ageing population in this room. Okay. This is an interesting experiment. Try this out with school kids. Ask them... What's this? And they will all give you the correct answer. They will all say, save. Do the next thing. Say, what's the picture? And they'll go, what are you talking about? I haven't got a clue. Floppy disks died out 15 years ago. No school kid will have a clue what that picture is. 
let's see how old you really are. An, an Apple guy did this and I was the only one in the room who, who knew what it was. Does anybody remember this? What is it? Yes, it depends on punch for a double single sided disc to make a double sided Well done. You don't look that old. Oh, You're man. A... <laughs> I remember buying my first floppy disc. I thought I bought a big thing that cost me $6 for one disc. And I was in a packet and bought them on their own. That's it. So that's why you'd buy a doubler. You'd put the notch for the right protect. You'd turn it over and you could use the other side. All right, one last one. Let me just turn down the volume a little bit. This might be a little bit loud. All right, this is the last one, I promise. And it's name this tune. <laughs> Sounds like most people know what that is. Whoops. All right, another question. Why is this particular photo famous? Anybody know? It's got a person in it. Very good. Just down there, because he's getting his shoe signed. At the time, the exposure time was 10 minutes. So this is a busy street in Paris um, in 1838, and that particular person was getting their boots polished. So he or she inadvertently became the very first person ever photographed. So the point to this, less than 200 years ago, no human being had ever been photographed. The world didn't know about iPhones or apps in 2006. So change is happening rapidly. And just to go back to our 200 years ago, imagine if that guy from 200 years ago was transported into Sydney, um, CBD. They would be bewildered. You know, cars, mobile phones, wireless internet. You know, they'd look around and they would be totally scared until they walk into this building and they go, ah, oh, and it's just so familiar. And what they've walked back into is a school. Okay? It looks exactly the same as it did 200 years ago. In fact, if we look at this lecture theatre, apart from the technology that we've got, it's the same as if you went to Oxford and Cambridge and looked at the lecture theatres they had back then. So, I'm talking about the mobile learning revolution. The first revolution with communication was printing back in 1450. Text became available to a broader audience, fertile ground for new ideas, and it ushered in the era of modern Europe. Let's have a look at e-books. I remember back in about 2005, I was reading articles that say e-books are dead. No one's going to want e-books. Um, you, know, you can't take them to the beach. You can't do this and blah, blah. All right, let's see what happened. Since 2005, just after 2010, wholesale books in the US. Uh, this is electronic books. Now, that's 2010. If we extrapolate it today, it would be crazy. Any ideas why that happened then? Yep. First iPad was released April 3rd, 2010. There were other reading devices before, but this is what brought about um, e-books. If we look at the same time, in 2010, e-books took up 3% of the print market. That's not print books, that's print and audio and everything to do with books, but they took up 97% of the market. A year later, that was over 200% increase in one year for e-books. And that's going back to 2011. Does that have ramifications? You bet. You know, try and find a Borders store these days. Now we get to mobile. So that was e-books, e-learning. Uh, you know that mobile is part, part of everyday life. But when it came to m-learning or mobile learning, we have a problem. And the problem was flash on iPads. That was a bit of a barrier to getting this revolution underway. But now we've got new tools, and HTML5 has become a standard. Um, it's not the only reason, uh, but I think the te technology has reached the tipping point. The M learning revolution has begun. We're at a, a major change in history. We're right in it, and many of you are part of that change. Some of the other things that have happened, uh, there are mobile players now. They're commonplace. And also, and this is important, there are marketplaces where people can sell online training. What that means is entrepreneurs will come in and really put lots of content in there. And if there's lots of content, people will start using it. So what can I do with HTML5? You can make iBook widgets. You can make interactive objects. And you can make mobile apps. Now, 
I got the job back at uh, UWS. They've got all these iPads in. I thought, great, I'm going to make these iBooks with these fantastic interactive widgets. And they gave me postgraduate engineering. And the postgraduates are not getting iPads. And I talked to the unit coordinators and they said, all the engineers have got PCs. No one's got Mac or, or iPad. So straight away, my idea of iBook widgets is out, out the window. Um, so it's platform de dependent. And one of the other problems another designer said is that their iBooks were getting too big because they put videos and the rest of it and the file sizes got, got too large. But you can do hybrids. You can make interactive objects. And what I like about that is that they are platform and LMS independent. You can put them in Blackboard, you can put them in Moodle, you can put them in WordPress, um, and so on. The big problem with that, of course, is that it requires internet. And if you want it to come offline, you can turn them into uh, a mobile app. Now, how do we create these things? We can create them by writing our own code. Wouldn't recommend it if you're not into that. Creative Commons or open source, there is available. I'm going to show you an example in a moment. There are HTML5 tools like Dreamweaver and Adobe series and the rest of it. Or a really easy one is anything that can export in HTML5. That's what I look for. and I'll demo that in a little while. But before we do, I want to just concentrate on this Creative Commons one, open source. I've been asked to give a talk to the Blended Learning Advisors at UWS. They said, you've got 15 minutes and five minutes of that is for questions. So you've got 10 minutes. So that's a challenge to me. I said, right, I'm going to make three objects, interactive objects from HTML5 in under 10 minutes. So um, this is the first time I've tried this. It's experimental. I'm, I, we'll see how we go. Uh, but I'm going to try and make those, these three objects in under 10 minutes. First thing you need to do if you're going to do this, I'm going to get it from someone's already written the source code. So I'm cheating a little bit. I'm not writing the code myself. But there's places like this one uh, where they've got interactive simulations which are uh, open source and you know, creative commons. I am going to make an app with this, but I couldn't make an app and sell it in the store from uh, this one. But it's just for demo purposes. You simply click on the oh. Play with Sims button and then select the uh, simulation you want. The one I'm after is in physics, electricity, it's called resistance in a wire. Now it's important to select run in HTML5. You can see I can adjust the uh, various factors here in the simulation. Now to get the HTML5 code, in Chrome I go View, Developer, and View Source, and I select Edit, Select All, then Edit, Copy, and it's now in the clipboard. Okay, I did that because I wasn't sure what the internet was going to be like, so I thought I'll make sure I've got one packaged in case it all falls over. So that's getting the source code from an open source thing. You can see in that site they've got stacks of simulations you could use. If you're teaching physics or chemistry or maths, you know, have a good look there. All right, now I want to create an interactive object. So what I would do is open up Moodle, or I've done this in Blackboard and WordPress, add the file, paste the code. Um, if I just paste the code, it will jump out to a new page. So I want it to stay inside Moodle, so I'm just going to add an embed link. Right, so in see. Moodle, I click on Add an Activity or Resource. I'm going to select Page and then Add. Enter a name and a description. I'm doing this in real time. I wanted to show you Scroll I didn't the budget. Page content and open the uh, HTML source editor and paste in the code from the clipboard and then select Update. I'm going to save it and return to the course. The problem is if I click on this link, it's going to open up in uh, a new page and take me outside of Moodle. So I'm going to click back. I'm going to grab the link of that, right mouse click and copy link address. Go to URL, add that. Enter a name and description again. Paste in the URL I just copied. And for appearance, I'm going to select Embed. And 
let's test this out, save and display. <coughs> And now it's embedded within the course. Now, I mean, you're going to see this same simulation over and over again. You'll get bored with it. But this can be any HTML5. Okay, that's the point I'm trying to make here. All right, if you've got iPads and iBooks and you want to make a widget, um, only requires a minimum of three files, an index.html file, or you can rename it. It can be a different name, but you need a main HTML file, a default picture, which is the screenshot that comes up inside the book, and this info.plist, which sounds esoteric, but it's just a little text file which has the properties. It's a property list. Um, and to see what's in there, you open the in Finder using show package contents. I'll show you how this works in a minute. Uh, that plist one, you can see, if I open it up in a text editor, the only things I would change, main HTML and the string, if I had a different index page, I'd change the name of the index.html. And I set it up for 768 by 1024 because that fits iPads nicely. But if you want to change the size, you can get in there and change it within the property list. That's just a text editor thing. All right, let's see if we can make an iBook widget from our code. Okay, we're going to open the text file, paste the code, save it as that, grab, get a screen grab of it, save that as the default picture, uh, replace the file. I just copied a, a widget that I replaced the files in, and then add it to iBook. So in a text editor, I paste in the HTML and I save that as index.html. I'm just going to run that so I can get a screenshot of the opening uh, screen. So I get a screen grab there. I'm going to open up preview and then do new from clipboard and then save that as, or export it as, default.png. Now to open up the widget, I've got a right mouse click and say show package contents. I'm going to delete the um, template ones I've got in there. Leave plist and I'll just copy the new ones that I've created. Then in iBooks author, I'm going to create a new book, just select the page, and then drag that widget onto the page. Place it where I want, give it a title, and an instruction that says click to open. I'll just center that. Now I can preview that. It opens up iBooks. And I can test my widget out. And yep, it's working inside a, an iBook. Alright, so the last one is mobile app. Has anybody here used Intel XDK? Oh boy, you're going to love this. If you want to do your own app, this thing is just fantastic. It's free. Uh, iBooks Author is free. Intel XDK is free. Work, this one works on Mac and Windows. I used to build apps with a thing called PhoneGap, which was okay, but I had to load up different emulators for all the different, you know, one for Android, one for Windows, one for iOS. It was a nightmare. Uh, this thing, it's all inbuilt and it steps you through the process of getting apps into the store. So we'll see how it works. So I open up Intel XDK, I can paste the code in, choose the Emulate tab to preview it, and then choose Build to build it. Now, I'm not going to build it here, so it won't, that won't be part of the 10 minutes. I'm just going to create it. So I open up Intel XDK, which is available for Mac and for Windows, and I click on Start with a blank project. Give it a name. and click Create. I'm not going to do the tour now. And then I just paste my HTML code. And click Emulate. And I can test it out on various devices after I save it. So 
So this is uh, what it looks like on an iPad. But then I can see what it looks like on other devices, such as a Samsung phone. If I go to the uh, testing, I can actually load it up on a phone and, or an iPad uh, or another tablet and see if it actually works. And when I'm ready, I can build it. It gives assistance in building to iOS, Android, Windows, and so on. Let me tell you, this was a, a godsend for me because putting apps into the App Store, there's all these certificates that have to go backwards and forwards. It's a, a nightmare. It took me half a day to do one of them. With this, it makes the certificates. It's got a cheat sheet which says da press download it now, go here, upload it. It's so quick to get it, even in Apple. Google's a lot easier. But um, yeah, if you're thinking of building apps, check out Intel XDK, marvellous. All right, so did I do it? Three objects in, un in under 10 minutes. I'd had a lot of explanation, so let's look at the videos that I did, which is where I built them. Get the code, 40 seconds. Interactive object, 1 minute 34. iBook widget. So less than six minutes, I created those three things. All right. Now, I did cheat. I had the source code there. So what happens if you can't find a suitable Creative Commons or open source object? You're not teaching physics. You want to build your own app. OK, what you do then, that's the one I look for, export HTML5. There's an increasing number of tools and services which can export to HTML5. I've used Articulate Studio. There's iSpring. Captivate, um, that's if you're on Windows. If you're on a Mac, there's iAd Producer. It's built for creating ads for a thing, but you can build apps in it. It's just fantastic. Uh, Hype is one for Mac. It will also, both of those will also do an iBooks widget for you straight out of the box. Then there are web-based solutions such as eLearning Brothers, um, online templates, H5P. I'll talk more about that one in a moment. And a whole stack of others. Look for HTML5 export. So here's an example. This is me using Articulate Studio. I just downloaded a, an example off the web just to try it out. So uh, here I'm using Articulate Engage, which can export as SCORM compliant and HTML5. So I publish that. Save that as a zip file. Go over to Moodle, add an activity, add a SCORM package, drag my file in, and then test it out to see what it looks like inside of Moodle. Obviously, the, the tricky thing is I've, I've done simulations with other people, and the, the hard bit is getting the content together and the storyboard and the storyline. The actual technology is simple these days. Uh, here's another one I use. My wife does an online magazine for um, people, uh, gardening therapy for the aged and disabled, because she takes disabled groups and they do gardening therapy. And um, so she's got her own magazine for that. And so I went and bought a program that can do an interactive PDF. Um, she doesn't have rich media in it, but we could include video and all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, but that's what I look for. It's got a thing there that says output type HTML. I go, yep, that's what I want. And just bear with me. I'll just jump out and show you what that looks like. Uh, I'll just go back to the cover. So we've got you know, your typical flipbook style of thing. Slowly loading up. And, but I could Im embed um, her, you know, it's got something from the editor, I could have her talking it in, just as, as well. Typically I will include a PDF version for people who uh, prefer to read it rather than or you know, put it on their iPad and so on. But the trick is you look for that HTML export. That was the secret there. 
Uh, here's a website, onlinetrainingtemplates.com. A lot of them are still, you can see the top row there. I've sort of scrolled off a bit, but they're all flash. So I don't even look at those. But the other ones have got flash and HTML. And I go, yep, I can use that. That sounds good. This one is of particular interest to me because the thing I don't like about some of the ones I'm going to show you is that the platforms still own the objects. I much prefer when I develop to keep the objects myself. I want to have control. This thing here, H5P, is HTML5package.org. Uh, They're trying to do a standard that will go into any CMS or LMS. At the moment, they've only got hooks for WordPress, Drupal, and Joomla, uh, but there's talk in the discussion of Moodle. No discussion of Blackboard, which is what UWS use. Uh, but it does a whole stack of things. The interactive video is one I'm really excited about. I will show you a platform example of interactive video a little later on. And by the way, the slides, I'll make the slides available, so, yeah. All right, now it's not just for HTML5. I did a, a little thing to show the blended learning team how we could do a little promo for our, our team. Now, I'll just, the sound might be a bit loud, but I'll just turn that down. But I'll just show you this and then I'll show you how long it took me to build. Now that goes on for about a minute, so I won't play the whole thing. But I showed that to them and they went, oh, wow, uh, it'd be great to do that. How long did it take you to do? Well, um, if you've got the right software, let me just... Now, I bought this uh, software when it was um, on pre-launch special, so it cost me $37. It would cost you all of $67 if you want this. Now, if you try to do an interactive video, not an interactive one, an animated video, It'll cost you a couple of hundred dollars if you go and outsource it and get people to and pay for it. This software now, you can buy the software for 67 and you can make as many of them as you want. So if I just create a new pro project, I'll just say Moodle. I'm going to add a slide and I've got a whole stack of templates. So I know which template I want. I want this whiteboard set and I'm going to say add all slides from that. Then what I do is go back to my first slide and I just go to the text and I change the text. Now, are you struggling with blended learning? It took me five minutes to do a promo for the team which looked professional. Now, this is where if, if you've got some managers here who look after budgets, you might be like my father. My father grew up through the Depression, and for him, free equaled good value. It took me many, many, many years to realise that good value equals good value. Free is not always the best option. For example, um, if I spend zero dollars, my father would be very proud of me, but if it takes me 100 hours to use this tool that I'm doing, uh, then it's, it's $60 an hour, say, that's $6,000. Whereas if I can spend $67, finish it in five minutes, that's good value. So managers, uh, I'll come back to that. <laughs> Everything is going to cost you. It's either going to cost you time or it's going to cost you money. And I, I sell other people's stuff through advertising and one product I've got, it's a $40 product, um, I spend about $10 a day in, in advertising to make between $50 to $100. So I'm quite happy every day to spend $10 because I'm making that money. I've got another product which is going to be going for $300. Then I might use LinkedIn ads because they're $2 a click. Now that might cost me $200 to make a sale, but if I'm making $297 from $200 ad spend, I'll do that every day. Thank you very much. So it's return on investment which is important. So here's a key takeaway for all of you. Technology is much easier to, to do if you have the right tools. So managers, make sure your people have the tools. If you're a developer and you need a tool, let your manager know, but put a business case. And then 
don't buy an expensive tool and never use it. You know, I know what it's like as a developer, you buy, want to have all the tools and play with them, but really think, I need this tool, it's going to save us this amount of time, it's worth the investment. All right, that's technology. Let's move on to marketing. Has anybody heard of the ADA model? It's pretty, it's a big one in, in marketing. It is not the be all and end all because it doesn't look at return customers and the rest of it, it's just for a one off sale. But this can be used in education, I'm going to demonstrate that. Basically, if I'm writing a sales page to sell something on the internet, first thing I need to do is grab someone's attention. Then I need to create um, desire, build their interest, and persuade them to take action. Now, getting attention, it could be a headline, a picture, or a video that might highlight a problem, paint a picture, here's your preferred future, might set a challenge, might ask a question, use a cliffhanger. You know, break, if anyone's seen Breaking Bad, they use cliffhangers really, really well. All right, so how do I use this in education? As an example, there are stacks of different ways you can introduce a topic. But the ability to capture attention is going to vary with them. So I'm going to show you three different examples. Here's the first one. Here's an explanation. Hello, my name is Walter Unglob, and this is What are Compressional Waves in Physics? A compressional wave is another way of saying a longitudinal wave. So a longitudinal wave is a type of wave that has its direction of propagation. Now, I think the most the interesting thing in this video is that he can write backwards. The displacement <laughs> of the medium in which the All right. The next thing you could do is provide a solution. Good morning, guys. This is Mr. T, and I'm going to guide you through the use of the equation that correlates the speed of light, frequency, and wavelength to this station. So looking at the equation right here... Yeah, it goes on and on, and provides a, a solution. Or 3.0 times... Here's another alternative, though, is to set a challenge. And this one I'm going to play all the way through, and there will be a challenge for you at the end. And this is a real one. This isn't fake like my first one. Today I'm at the University of Sydney talking to uh, Rod Cross, who's uh, done physics for many, many decades. Uh, you are perfectly correct. I was a student here in 1960. Wow. So he certainly knows a lot about physics. And today we're doing an experiment involving a slinky. Can you tell me about it? Uh, well, I have here a, a slinky in my hand. I'm going to hold the slinky by the top end, let the bottom end go so the slinky stretches. And it dangles freely. And I'm going to ask the question, what happens when I let go at the top end? Will the bottom end fall first? Will the top end fall first? Will both ends fall together? Or will the centre of the slinky stay at rest and the top end and the bottom end approach each other and they collapse in the middle? Make your prediction and then I'll drop it. Ready, set, go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. OK. And <laughs> so now it's time for your choice. You have to pick one of those. Will the bottom fall first? Will the top fall first? Will they both fall together or will they come into the centre? Pick one of those, one, two, three or four. And now we're going to have a show of hands. Who's for one? Who's for two? Three. Oh, three's popular. Four. Okay, very good. Now one of the disadvantages of doing it this way, I've got no idea of the numbers and some people won't put their hands up. Other people will wait and see what everybody else is going for and they'll put their hands up. So we'll look at a way you can get around that. Oh, sorry, did I tell you this? To turn off your phones? Now, well, forget that. Get out your phones and your tablets, but keep them on silent. Because what are, we're going to do a poll, an online poll, so if you've got access to the internet, get, get them out. And what I'd like you to do is to go to app.gosoapbox.com and the... Um, the code to enter this event is M14. So I'll just jump out. M14 is the code. I'll, I'll just I'll put it back up again. App.gosoapbox.com. And you'll find there's two polls in there. Hopefully there is. One is for a bit later on, but answer it anyway, because we'll see the answers. And um, the slinky challenge is in there as well.
So if you have any trouble getting on, let, let me know. This is the first time I've done it with a large group, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. You shouldn't have to if you put that code in, just M14. Just do it, don't sign in. Yeah, you don't have to sign in. So it should look... It should look like that. And so the access code, you just put in M14 and join now. And what I will do is go and have a look at it from, hopefully. I have to refresh my thing here. Are they in there? Yeah, yeah. Where can you see them? Oh, okay. Yep. Oh. Oh, that's probably a good idea. All right, I'll go in here and join this one. Forty-eight responses, yeah, but I want to see what they actually are. But they should match up closely with what the hands were. Ah, uh, ah, uh, thank you very much. All right, I'll have to read them out. We've got them here. Thank you for that. Uh, bottom falls first, zero percent. Top falls first, ten percent. Both ends fall together, twenty-three percent. Ends approach each other, a whopping sixty-eight percent. So um, that's at the time when that was done. So that's the results. If my internet was going well, I would be seeing that. But that's what you see. So most people went for the last option there. Okay, you can keep doing those. Answer the other question as well because that will be interesting for later on. And if you haven't answered it, do it at some stage. But um, would you like to know the answer? Yeah? Okay. I'll tell you in the next presentation. <laughs> okay. What's that an example of? Cliffhanger. Cliffhanger. You can do that at the end of a lecture. You can say, here's a problem, give them something really intriguing, and then say, hey, you've got to be at the next lecture to find that out. I know one lecturer, this isn't a cliffhanger, but another thing that I heard a lecturer do, he came in at the beginning of the lecture and he tied some old runners there. And then he started the lecture and he had absolute attention the entire lecture. <laughs> At the end, he just undid them and walked out. <laughs> Never said a word. All right, so here's the answer. But this is going to be really tough to see, so how are we going to actually determine what the right answer is? Uh, if I were to drop it now, it would happen so fast you wouldn't really see clearly what's happening. So I've brought along my slow motion camera, and you'll see it at 300 frames per second and it's quite spectacular. Well, that's ultra slow-mo. So that's exactly what we need to sort out this problem. We'll give a, a countdown, because oh. it happens really fast. All right. Three, two, one, drop. Wow, did you see that? <laughs> I, 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 I didn't really see which happened first. No, I need to, need to slow that down. Well, let's go to a slow motion replay and see what actually happened. Now he does go on and give an explanation, but we don't have time for that. You can look it up on the YouTube and see it. 10% of people in this room got it correct. You did better. I did this with the engineering staff and most of them got it wrong. So. All right, now. Uh, 
Okay, let's have a look at those three videos and the amount of attention that they got. So here's our explanation one, and it got 258 views. Oh, hang on a sec, I put my little alarm on to let me know how I was going for time. 15, very good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 258 views for the explanation. Now, I'm not saying explanations are bad, I'm just saying this, this particular one. Um, the solution one, got a lot more, 9,674. This one, 1,794,000. Now, there may be other factors involved, but um, what I'm saying is you do something that grabs the student's attention. And um, one of the ways you can do that, anybody here heard WIFM? Yep. What's in it for me? Thank you. The most important marketing concept of all time. What's in it for me? Small business owners, I tell them, when people hit your website, that's the only question you've got to answer. Don't tell them your mission statement. You know, they want to know what's in it for me. Same for the students. It works for the students. So highlight benefits, not features. When the students first hit your class, what are you most likely to do? Okay, in week three, we're going to do this, and um, here's the, the learning outcomes, the rest of it. What you really need to do is demonstrate the relevance. It may be, um, uh, I could have a picture of a building, or video of a building falling down, say, hey, if you don't pay attention through this class, this is what's going to happen with your buildings. Or it might be a testimonial of a graduate who comes out and says, oh, when I started this unit, I thought, I'm never going to use this in my job, but now that I'm in the job, I'm using it all the time, so pay attention. Um, for me, the one that really stands out, Biology 1, it was my first ever university lecture. lecture. It was television-based. I couldn't believe it. My very first lecture theatre, and it was on the screens. And it was just fantastic. The, the TV's fired up, and this scuba diver comes out of the water with all this algae. And it was Peter Valder. I don't know if you know Peter Valder, but he's a fantastic presenter. And that got me engrossed from the beginning. You know, straight away, I thought, wow, what's, what's going on here? That's how you should start a semester. Okay, what's in it for me? Let the students know this is why they should be sitting in your class. There's a really important reason you need to let them know. Uh, pedagogical re-engineering, re that was uh, my doctoral topic. And um, I love blended and online learning because ordinary staff, academic staff, are thinking about how we can re-engineer and cater for people. Uh, for example, we've now got open iPad exams because that's authentic assessment. People in the workplace will have iPads with them and internet connections and so they're just building questions where it's, they've, even though they've got access to the internet, they still need to be able to evaluate and analyse and so on. But it can be a lengthy process at many institutions, including UWS. So I'm only on contract for 12 months, so I said we need to have some quick wins. Medium term, we're going to try and improve the pedagogy and improve the performance but quick wins without changing assessment, without doing anything like that, we can hit perception. Now, people pay for packaging. If you go to the supermarket, you're gonna, if you bought capsicums, you know, packaged, it's going to cost you more than if you put them in your own brown paper bag. If you buy a book with a cover, it's going to the same content, it's going to cost you more money. The perceived value of things, text is the lowest, then graphics, then video, interactivity and the gold standard, what people w really, really want is personal contact. But that's the hardest to provide when you've got a thousand students. What's that? Yeah. Thank you. All right, so text's okay, graphics add value, video adds more value, interactivity, that's a, I can slide there, my wife shows how to do a herb spiral, you can slide through those things, and personal contact is the most highly valued. Now, interactive activities take on more importance if we're going to do fully online. And so what I want to do is show you this one. The question, what happens when I let go at the top end? So we can build videos now which can stop at a certain point. You can ask a question. Bottom end fall first. Will the top end fall first? Will both ends fall together? Or will the centre of the slinky stay at rest and the top end and the bottom end approach each other and they collapse in the middle. Make your prediction and then I'll drop it. Ready? So Set, go. Okay, so that was just adding something to a YouTube video. Um, it's really simple to build. It's a thing called EduCanon. Uh, it's for free. 
um, if you just have multiple choice. If you want to have the um, put in a text answer or a um, short uh, fill in the blank, then it costs you money. Uh, but even the free one's really good. And basically, all you do is you put in the URL, and then you can crop the video to whatever size you want. So if it's an hour-long video, but you only want 50 seconds of it, you can crop it, and then you can add questions to it. Not only that, it's got a back end, and that will tell you, did they watch the video? Did they watch the whole video? Did they get the answers right? And are there any common misconceptions? Because what it does, it comes up with... I'm just going to show you how to put a link for unregistered students. You can register students, put them in a class. So the student takes, follows that link. It's in the details. But you can assign them to a class. I'm just showing you can do it without that as well. So they work their way through it. And then you can go to the back end and select, and you've got your students in there, and it will tell you, you know, this is the answer they put in. You can give them points for that, and whether they got the answer right or wrong, and you can see green and red and all the rest of it. So if everyone had red, you'd know, oh, that question was a problem. You know, they all got it wrong, and so on. Next one, level of support. I'll go quickly through this one. Typical site, this was one I had to, to look at for someone. Um, what I do with business people is I put in New members start here and have an orientation video. Then take a tour to find out what's available. Here's one I'm building for one of the engineers um, and we're putting in an intro video. That's not him, we haven't videoed it yet. Uh, small changes can make a big difference. Uh, yeah, we'll do this one. This is a Facebook campaign from a business. Tell me which one you think worked well. One worked well in one year, the other one was terrible. Tell us a special story about your mother. This is on Facebook. What's the one word that best describes your mother? Okay. Who thinks A would have been the winner there on Facebook? Who thinks B? Who doesn't think? Okay. <laughs> All right, majority got that one. And the reason is that people are time poor. And they don't have time to write lengthy responses. But having said that, here's an example my wife put in. Um, something I'd never eat is, and we had things like kidney or liver, McDonald's, camel's testicles, and so on. But someone had more time, so they wrote a lengthy response. Um, tell people what to do. This is a business thing. I tell business owners, tell them to like your page, to share, to comment. Uh, here's her website. And again, I've got, click one of the options. I'm telling them what to do. Because people have to make decisions all the time, and they don't want to have to make decisions. Tell them what to do. How do we do that in education? Have a learning planner. Week one, do this, do this. They don't want to think about it. Just tell me what I need to do. They're, they're time poor, particularly the postgraduate engineers. They've got a job. Uh, KISS principal, I'm putting together uh, infographics to make it easier for them. If you want to get help, do this, you know, follow this flow chart. Uh, just with online consultations, I do this for business owners. Um, they pay big money for personal contact with me. Nine times out of ten, they don't book. Okay? I am not overwhelmed. If you have online consultations, you are not going to be overwhelmed. Uh, visual Appeal, that's a generic site. We just add branding. Um, but as well as making it look pretty, I give student, we need to think we've got a diverse student audience. They've got different learning styles, uh, different circumstances. When I drove down, I wanted to listen to audio. If I'm at work, I'll print something out. If I'm on a train, I'll read an iBook. And how are we going? We've five minutes. All right, I'll quickly go through this. Time-saving tips. Re record, repurpose and recycle. Build once, use many times. Focus on evergreen content, content that doesn't change. I developed up these tutorials 2009. They're still in use today. Uh, you can record things that are happening. I won't go through it all. But they can keep re reusing this. Actually That's shows an activity. This um, let me ask you, did you ever have a great idea for an app or another online product? And did you act on it? This is one I showed to business people. It's an entrepreneurial thing. It's not for educators, but you might get something out of this one. It's a bit hey cheesy. Joe, when are you ever going to put your idea online? Relax, Cal. It's not like anyone else is going to have the exact same idea that pops into my head. 
How do you know no one else has thought of it, Harry? Because they haven't, Kelly. It's totally original. It's one in a gazillion. Oh, really? 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 It's idiot proof. It's a real money maker. And thank goodness I put it online first. More champagne, sir? More everything, Sky Waitress. <laughs> <laughs> Don't wait. Register your big idea as a .co domain Echo Dad. All right, so. We'll finish on this one. To make an app, you need two, because I've been talking about tools, saving time. Um, to make an app, you need two of the most sophisticated tools ever made. Does anybody know what they might be? Time? Yeah, it's not a tool, though. It's not something you can get in your brain, yeah, but it's still not a tool. I'm thinking physical. These are the ones I'm thinking of. A pen and paper. This is how my wife builds apps. She does that on paper. She gives it to me. And I create the app. Um, this guy here, anybody heard of him? He sold over 35 million $1 apps. But you have to feel sorry for him because he gives 30% of that to Apple. So he's only got 70% of $35 million. <laughs> he's never written a single line of computer code in his life. He says, not a lot of barrier to entry to get into. Anyone can. If you have, are creative, that's what's important. Forget the technical stuff because you can outsource. You can outsource voiceovers, iBook covers, HTML code for an app, and more. Uh, stop trying to do everything yourself, unless you've got a team there. It's going to cost you time or money. We outsource to doctors, mechanics, and the rest of it. So why are we trying to do everything? Um, and it doesn't have to cost a fortune. Here's an example. Uh, how many people know Fiverr? A few people. You get jobs done for $5. For example, if you don't have a radio voice, we learned how to do radio voices earlier. Uh, but if you can't, don't have a radio voice and you want to hire someone for a quick introduction, just go to Fiverr. Hey there. Do you need an Australian female voiceover artist with a 100% feedback rate for only $5? Well, you've come to the right page. Hey there. Ooh. Do you need an... OK, so it's time to wrap up. In summary, the M-Learning revolution has begun. Technology is much easier with the right tools. You can outsource technology skills. Pedagogical re-engineering will take time, and I think marketing can be implemented in education. You can tie those things together very, very well. And uh, if you're interested in working together, I'm on a short-term contract, so I'm looking for the next challenge. I'm only working an hour a week. So if uh, you think we might be able to work together, get in touch with me, uh, g.salter at uws.edu.au, or I think there's cocktails and canapes and things and dinner. So uh, come and have a chat with me.